Hi everyone, and thanks for taking the time to check out my talk, A Theory of DeFi, uh, here at the ACM CCS Workshop on DeFi and Security. Uh, and let me open just by thanking the workshop organizers, um, so Philip and Don and Roger and Arthur, uh, both for putting together uh, such a nice workshop um, on a very timely topic, uh, and also I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak. So thanks very much to all four of them uh, for the invitation. Uh, this talk is not going to be so focused on my own research, though at times I will allude to ongoing work in progress uh, with a PhD student of mine at Columbia, uh, Jason Milionis. So a common refrain you hear uh, in DeFi is, it's still early, uh, usually referring you know, perhaps to investment opportunities or perhaps just to adoption, so the number of users uh, thus far. And while I agree with both of those two sentiments, I mean, here I mean something different. So here I'm really speaking as a theoretician, right? I do theoretical computer science for a living. And from the, a theoretician's perspective, boy, is it early in DeFi. And indeed, one really tricky thing to figure out as a theoretician is, you know, at what point is some technology kind of stable and advanced enough um, that it's worth your time to sort of work hard to build a really nice theory around it? You know, on the one hand, you want to be sort of very forward looking. You want to produce theory that will actually you know, help things that haven't been built yet. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you don't want to work hard to produce some beautiful theory that's just obsolete uh, in 18 months. So I think it's an interesting open question uh, whether DeFi has sort of matured enough that it makes sense to start building uh, building a theory around it. I think reasonable people could disagree uh, on that question. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to, for the sake of argument, assume um, that it's worth starting to build a theory around DeFi uh, and postulate what that theory might look like. And to explore that idea, I want to spend just a few minutes kind of looking at the recurring patterns that we see uh, over the last you know, several decades of computer science research about how sort of useful theory develops alongside uh, new technologies. So, you know, what's theory good for? What, is, what does theory bring to the table? Um, well, you know, to be honest, the thing that sort of grabs the most headlines, like the, the, the lion's share of the spotlight, tends to be, you know, quite deep and difficult theorems. And indeed, this is a fantastic contribution of theory to broader computer science. It also kind of feeds into, you know, that romantic ideal people have of, you know, Andrew Wiles, you know, working away secretly in his attic for eight years trying to solve um, proof for Matt's last theorem. So on the rest of this slide, I'm just going to sort of flash briefly a bunch of examples of sort of what I mean, difficult theorems in different branches of theoretical computer science. Um, it's not important that you read this or know any of these. My guess is uh, one or two at least will be familiar to you. I'm sure some will probably not be familiar to do, and that's that's fine. The point here is just that, you know, theory is a, is a, has many, many branches. It's touched on many parts of computer science, many types of technologies. Um, and often once a theory matures, you do in the end get some quite deep, quite difficult uh, mathematical results. Now, in DeFi, it's not really obvious we're ever going to have any interesting, difficult theorems at all. We may, definitely a possibility. I would argue that we don't right now. But the good news is that, you know, even while the difficult theorems kind of grab most of the headlines, um, some really, really impactful stuff happens uh, en route to those difficult theorems as prerequisite for a mature theory. So the first prerequisite of getting to the hard theorems is you got to prove the easy theorems. You got to prove the stuff that we teach to undergraduates and be beginning graduates uh, in our courses. But I don't want to give um, easy theorems short shrift. It's not like their purpose in life is merely to assist us in proving hard theorems. These are often super, super interesting and clarifying in their own right. Indeed, our mental models for different parts of computer science are often shaped fundamentally um, by easy theorems you can prove. I'll argue later in this talk that in DeFi we actually are starting to see some easy theorems which are indeed quite clarifying about how to think about the space. So easy but clarifying theorems I already think is sort of a big victory um, when you're building a, a theory around some kind of technology. Um, but in fact there's even a prerequisite to these which is you need the language to even sort of phrase your theorems. So the pre prerequisite that it comes out usually comes out of um, a theoretical study is just the basic mathematical definition. So it's literally just naming, identifying, and naming the key objects of study, and introducing the words, the vocabulary, to talk, to talk about the properties of those objects. And once again, in theoretical computer science, there are many, many examples. In fact, I really think you could make a strong case that the the biggest export from theoretical computer science to the rest of computer science and the rest of sciences and engineering 
are in fact our definitions, right? NP completeness being one obvious example, but there's many, many others. And in DeFi, I would argue this is actually exactly where we are. So not only do we not have sort of an academically rigorous textbook on DeFi, obviously, way too early for that, um, but you know, if we even think about what that book might look like, presumably we don't know what theorem 1.1 is. We don't know the first result. Uh, I don't even think we know what definition 1.1 is in that textbook. I'm not even sure all of the words that are going to be used in definition 1.1 uh, have been invented yet. So this is kind of what we're fumbling around with. And this is the usual kind of honorable, if humble, beginnings of any theory. What are the sort of most fundamental objects? What are the most fundamental properties? Um, so that you can get to those easy theorems and start developing your mental model for how the area works. So that's how I would sort of expect um, a theory of DeFi to unfold. You know, we're currently struggling with the vocabulary and the basic definitions. You know, hopefully those start settling in, in, the, in the upcoming years. Hopefully we'll have some good collection of easy theorems. Maybe those, you know, are sort of en route to more difficult theorems. Maybe already our definitions and easy theorems will give us, you know, a super, a super useful theory, uh, which itself would be a, a tremendous victory. So what do, I, what do I mean by a helpful theory? What are we hoping to get out of this whole endeavor? Uh, right, because often when you talk about theory, you know, you're thinking very kind of, you know, blue sky. You're thinking kind of, let's understand, you know, the computational mysteries of the universe, right? The physicists are trying to figure out the Big Bang, and the computer science theorists are trying to figure out uh, the P versus MP question, as they should be doing. That is absolutely a huge part of what computer science theory um, should be working on. Now, for DeFi, this is probably not the main point. Although, you know, I don't want to dismiss this possibility, right? So, like, if you look at all of the sort of action going on uh, with validity roll-ups and various sort of scaling solutions for Ethereum and other smart contracts platforms, I mean, honestly, that absolutely crucial technology has its roots in work from the 1980s in theoretical computer science about understanding the mysteries of the universe. So this can definitely feed back into useful technology, you know, but arguably for DeFi, at least here in the early stages, this, this is not what we're trying to do so much. Um, one thing we might be trying to do is look at the existing solutions that are out there, so existing protocols in DeFi, and ask, you know, can we do some kind of theoretical analysis of the properties? And in the bet, you know, maybe we sort of identify some weaknesses, or maybe in the best case, we actually justify the existence of existing um, popular protocols by proving some kind of optimality theorem or characterization role result. Uh, or anything else which kind of says, you know, this is the right design in some sense of the word. But beyond just um, analyzing and perhaps justifying existing designs, theory holds the promise uh, of doing better, okay, of actually clarifying the design space and the unexplored parts of the design space, wherein there may hopefully lie solutions even better than the ones we have now. And again, this is something we've seen play out over and over again in different parts of theoretical computer science uh, over the years. And at least on the second and, and third points, you know, I would argue there are huge opportunities here for any theoreticians um, interested in engaging with DeFi. So on the second point, certainly there's, you know, plenty of protocols out there that we know and love, you know, the Uniswaps of the world, etc. Um, and frankly, most of them have very little formal analysis. And so I think that's a very impactful way to sort of start getting involved, ask exactly what mathematical properties do the different existing designs have. Uh, but then also, I don't think anybody feels like we've come up with like the best way of doing trades or best way of doing, you know, lending. I think everyone's expecting there to be sort of more interesting mechanisms, you know, in the years to come. Uh, and theory actually really might be able to help guide us toward better designs. Again, by sort of articulating the design space, particularly the parts of the design space that we haven't really explored yet. All right, so let me start getting a little bit more concrete. So suppose you wanted to contribute uh, along the lines of the second or third point on the previous slide to either justify existing designs or, or sort of you know guide, guide us toward new and interesting designs. How would you go about doing it? Definitely more than one ans answer to that question, but let me here advocate sort of one concrete approach uh, which has served theoretical computer science very, very well over and over again over the past half century, which is to take an optimization approach. So in other words, you need to identify, you know, a design space. So what is the range of possible solutions you're willing to consider? You need to identify an objective function or maybe multiple objective functions that you'd like to optimize. Um, and then the goal is to identify optimal or near optimal designs uh, with respect to your objectives. 
So first step of the optimization approach, um, which again, we're still sort of, I think, grappling with very much in DeFi, is you need to articulate the design space. What is allowed? There's no question that a big reason for the success of, say, you know, approximation algorithms is that everyone agrees on the design space, you know, polynomial time algorithms, right? So for different DeFi problems, what's the design space? That's a good question. I'll show you one part of DeFi where we sort of have an answer to that question uh, in a couple slides. The second step is to articulate what you want. So what objective function you would like to maximize or minimize. Or maybe you have more than one objective function and you'd like to study trade-offs between them. That's fine too. So in most areas of theoretical computer science, in hindsight, the objective function looks super obvious, like you want to minimize the running time, you want to maximize the fault tolerance of a consensus protocol, whatever. Um, I'd say in DeFi, at least right now, I don't know that we have a very good sense of what objective functions we should be looking at. Uh, though that I, I think that is one of the things that's likely to lock into place over the next uh, year or two, which should then really sort of um, enable research to accelerate. So I already mentioned how, you know, parts of theoretical computer science succeed because they have an agreed upon design space, but they really start to succeed and flourish when there's also an agreed upon objective function, like minimizing the running time, minimizing the approximation ratio, uh, et cetera. Do not underestimate the ingenuity that comes out from super smart people uh, when you set up an agreed upon leaderboard. And you can have your name at the top of the leaderboard as long as you come up with a design which is better on whatever agreed upon objective than all of the previous ones. That's been the source of an unbelievable amount of really cool results in theoretical computer science. All right, so in DeFi, you know, I really think there's a lot of work to do, you know, focusing on what objective function should we be looking at. Um, once we've settled on one or a couple, you know, then again, we'd like to prove guarantees. We'd like to prove that designs are sort of as good or almost as good as possible with respect to whatever metrics uh, we've adopted. And in the DeFi space, I actually think it's super plausible that this three-step framework will be carried out successfully in lots of different parts of the space. I think that's really a realistic goal for the next couple of years. Honestly, at the moment, we're basically in step one. We're just trying to figure out, like, you know, what does it mean to talk about all automated market makers or all lending pl platforms? You know, what, what, are we, what, is, what does that actually mean mathematically? Okay, so how might a theory of DeFi develop? Well... I would be very surprised if it develops top down. I very much think it's it's inevitably going to develop uh, bottom up, right? We were just talking about the difficulty of articulating the design space, and if you start at the top level of, of sort of a logical tree, like all of DeFi, I don't even think it makes sense to talk about articulating the design space of all of DeFi, right? Because DeFi includes like many different things. Right, you can focus on borrowing and lending platforms, you can focus on decentralized exchanges, you can focus on yield aggregations, yield aggregation protocols. Um, you shouldn't expect to sort of have a unified theory of all of those. Each probably demands its own uh, bespoke analysis. So I think what you want to do is you want to descend into this tree, you know, one or more levels uh, until you get something bite-sized that you feel like you have a handle on. And so in the rest of this talk, we're going to look into decentralized exchanges. Um, and they actually come in many, in, in, in quite different flavors. So for example, you've got order book designs, you know, that mirror, say, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and then you've got automated market makers, like, for example, uh, Uniswap. Um, and so, you know, I think especially just to bootstrap the theory initially, I think it's totally fine to just zoom in to sub subsets of what you know the true design space to be, just again, to get, you know, at least a detailed understanding of a bite-sized piece of the space. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to actually ignore order book formats. We're going to focus squarely on automated market makers. Uh, I do want to give a brief shout out to a paper that showed up a few weeks ago by Chitra and Garris and Evans, um, which actually does try to compare the two types of designs, which I think is actually a great research question. Formalized senses in which order books are better than AMMs or vice versa. Uh, very early on, it was noted that from a gas efficiency perspective, uh, AMMs are superior. Order books generally take uh, much more gas to run than an automated market maker. Um, and Chitra et al. also observed uh, an advantage of AMMs in that they can re-equilibrate after a loss of liveness with only O of 1 transactions, whereas order book designs tend to need more than a constant number of transactions um, to re-equilibrate if they go offline for, for some period of time. Okay, but that, that's pretty much all I want to say about order books. The rest of the talk, I really want to sort of delve into the, to the automated market makers. Now, even within AMMs, there's different kinds of designs you can look at. And indeed, I'm going to zoom in even further 
to a subclass of AMMs known as constant function market makers. Now, the good news is, is this actually does capture um, kind of all of the popular examples you see uh, in DeFi. So it's not clear we're losing very much from this restriction, but it will give us a more well-defined theory problem. So ultimately, the rest of this talk, this is where we're going to be working, constant function uh, market makers. And this is what I mean by developing a theory of DeFi bottom-up. Specialize, specialize, specialize. Go down, down, down in the tree until you get a bite-sized piece where you actually feel like you have a shot at articulating the design space, maybe even optimizing over that design space. Then once you've sort of figured out some of the leaves of this tree, then start advancing the frontier of knowledge upward. That realistically, I think, is how you get a, a reasonably general theory. So let's dive in and start talking about automated market makers. Um, maybe just one slide to just pause um, for some history, uh, just to point out that you know, it's not like AMMs were invented for DeFi. Okay? AMMs already existed uh, even at the end of the 20th uh, century, and the original motivation was actually prediction markets. So prediction markets are systems where anybody can basically bet uh, on the outcome of some event which is uncertain but will eventually be verifiable. The canonical example here would be like a presidential election. So right now, you could go to the Iowa electronic markets um, and place a bet on whether you think a Democrat or Republican is going to be the winner of the 2024 U.S. Uh, presidential election. And the way you set up the betting in a prediction market is you invent some fictitious securities, Aero de Bru securities, where each security corresponds to a possible outcome. That security pays off a dollar if that outcome uh, eventually occurs and it pays off zero otherwise. Then you just sort of open it up and let people trade. Uh, and basically, whatever the market prices are for the various securities, you can interpret as the market's belief um, uh, in the form of a probability distribution over the various outcomes that could happen. So if, you know, back you know, a couple years ago, if like Biden stocks were, were um, trading at 70 cents uh, and Trump stocks were trading at 30 cents, uh, if you want, you can interpret that, that the market believes with 70% probability Biden's uh, going to be the winner. So like with any exchange, there's a lot of different designs you can consider. And, you know, the initial prediction markets, beginning with um, the IO electronic markets, they just sort of took their inspiration from the New York Stock Exchange and they just implemented a sort of standard central limit order book um, type design. And for something like the U.S. presidential election, you know, that's sort of fine because you wind up having lots of liquidity, sort of low bid-ass spreads, uh, plenty of trading. But then once they expanded to having sort of lots of random congressional races, um, they, they encountered a, a problem you can have with central uh, with order book designs, which is a lack of liquidity. Big um, bid-ass spreads and just not much trading. So not much ability to actually match uh, buy and sell orders. And so motivated by this lack of liquidity, right, at a, at a time when like blockchains were not even a gleam in anyone's eyes, um, that's when automated market makers came along, right? So one early example, which actually still exists, um, is the Hollywood Stock Exchange, uh, where you can use automated market makers to buy or sell securities corresponding to, you know, who's going to win the Oscar, you know, how much sort of revenue is some film going to generate on opening weekend, um, etc. So what's the key difference between order book designs and AMMs, automated market makers? Well, with an order book, right, to trade, you need a counterparty. If you want to buy a certain number of shares of some security, there needs to be some seller out there willing to sell you those shares at, at the price that you're willing to pay, uh, and conversely. Whereas with an automated market maker, the platform itself uh, will always uh, be willing to serve as the counterparty, as long as you're willing to buy or sell at whatever price it is that the uh, AMM is quoting to you. Now, by virtue of being willing to take either side of any trade, okay, at a given price, uh, an AMM has to be willing to lose money, right? Because only one side of that trade is going to wind up in the money at the end of the day. Um, so AMMs, or at least the, the liquidity providers for AMMs, um, have to be ready to, to lose money as trades occur. That's kind of the price of enabling trades at all times. So there's actually a super nice theory of automated market makers for prediction markets. I sometimes teach parts of this theory uh, in my algorithmic game theory courses. Uh, and there's one AMM that sort of stands out as by far the most well-known and most widely used in a prediction market context. Uh, which is known as LMSR. That stands for Logarithmic Market Scoring Rule, um, developed by Robin Hansen uh, at the beginning of this century. Okay, but my only point here is that automated market makers have been, been around for a while. They actually have already shown that you can build a really nice theory of them, at least in the prediction markets context. 
Um, and then AMMs, sort of in a DeFi context, are really tech transfer from this earlier work that's been done on prediction markets. So moving on to uh, our primary focus, which is DEXs, or decentralized exchanges. Uh, an exchange, of course, is a platform where you can buy, sell, or trade various tokens. And of course, in the blockchain world, there's many, many, many tokens that people are interested uh, in trading. And of course, there's various ways you can uh, implement an exchange. So for example, you can consider order book models. Uh, and indeed, centralized exchanges, you know, Coinbase and the like, they largely do follow um, order book models. Uh, and that's because they don't have to worry about gas costs. They're just doing all computation kind of on their own servers. Uh, if you wanted to implement a decentralized exchange, for example, one that ran on top of Ethereum, um, then you really have to worry about gas costs and order book designs you know, are probably prohibitively uh, costly. But interestingly, actually, in, in, in the blockchain world, there's, there's a second reason other than gas costs to con seriously consider automated market makers, which is the same reason that they uh, gained popularity in the prediction markets world, which is a lack of liquidity. Right, if you're trading kind of ETH versus USDC, probably you have tons of liquidity. Um, but you know, as we know, there's a lot of long tail tokens out there, and you can't expect to have a, a large amount of liquidity for all possible, uh, all possible token pairs. So in the same way that you might want to have a platform which is sort of always ready for business, always ready to buy or sell tokens at a given price, even if it's a very long tail token, um, that suggests considering an automated market maker design. AMM started being to, being discussed for be being built on Ethereum around maybe 2016, 2017. Um, the exact order of operations here is not sort of completely clear to me, but it, it's clear that some of the early people discussing this idea were Vitalik Buterin of the Ethereum Foundation uh, and Martin Koppelman and Alan Liu from Gnosis. And their proposal, I really want to break it down into sort of two different ideas, both of which I think are really um, interesting ideas. The first idea is really just a tech transfer idea, and the second idea is really a, a specific design choice, a novel design decision. So idea number one is just to sort of recognize, you know, one, we want exchanges, we want crypto exchanges, two, we want to have alternatives to centralized exchanges, you know, three, if we build it on top of a, of a blockchain like Ethereum, you know, you're going to have to do something other than order books. And they were aware of the popularity of LMSR in a prediction markets contest, a context of automated market makers. And so big idea number one is let's use AMMs on top of Ethereum, okay, to implement a decentralized exchange. Okay, so that's already kind of a really great idea, sort of tech transfer idea. The second idea actually, as far as I know, does not have an analog over in the prediction markets world. So they actually proposed an AMM that looks fundamentally different than the ones that had been used in prediction markets. So the specific design they suggested, the x times y equals k curve, nowadays we might refer to it as a special case of a constant function market maker, or CFMM. Uh, and again, this is a really nice idea. And as far as I know, as you know, in 2016, this was a completely novel idea to do it this way. So what's the idea? The idea is you're going to encode what trades a trader is allowed to carry out through an invariant function. Okay, something I'm going to call little f. F is a function of the quantities of remaining to tokens of each of the token types supported by the pool. You know, in this talk, just think of k equal 2. Just imagine we have a pool that has uh, A tokens, it has B tokens. Um, so the function is going to be a function of X, the number of A tokens, and Y, the number of B tokens. So when a trader does a trade, you know, one of them is going to go up, like X will go up and Y will go down, or vice versa. Uh, and we're going to call a trade allowable if and only if the increase in one is completely canceled out by the decrease in the other with respect to the function f. Okay, so you can trade from x comma y to x prime y prime if and only if f of x y is equal to f of x prime y prime. You'll notice there is no explicit uh, price okay, in this description. Uh, however, it does imply a spot price of, say, you know, of token A in terms of token B uh, according to the ratio of the partial derivatives of F with respect to the various token types. So for example, uh, Uniswap corresponds to the example of the invariant function F of XY equals X times Y, the product of X and Y. And here the implied price of A tokens denominated in B tokens is going to be Y divided by X, right? Which makes sense because like if you have very few A tokens left, if X is very small, this is saying the spot price is going to be very high. As you have fewer and fewer of A tokens left, you're going to have to pay more and more for them uh, in terms of the number of B tokens. 
All right, so these two sort of big ideas reported at basically the same time really kicked off kind of AMMs in the DeFi space, okay? Use AMMs to implement decentralized exchanges. And by the way, actually think maybe about this particular type of AMM, a CFMM, uh, as your design. Most of the most popular DEXs out there are in fact special cases of CFMMs. They differ only in the choice of what invariant function little f they use. <clears throat> Uniswap, and speaking here about Uniswap V1 and V2, the x times y equals k curves, uh, as we mentioned, that's the special case of a CFMM in which the invariant function little f is the product of the two token quantities, the product of x and y with the implied spot price of y over x. Balancer is a generalization of Uniswap where there's an additional parameter little w which controls how much sort of of the value of the pool you want to be, be devoted to token A versus token B. So here Uniswap would correspond to the special case of Balancer where w uh, equals a half. Uh, a very different kind of um, CFMM would use the sum, okay, so we're just the, the total number of tokens of both types combined uh, should stay the same. Unlike the other examples on this slide, this cannot support trading at all different prices. The implied price is always equal to one, so you're doing one for one trades between token A and token B if you're using this invariant function. Uh, and then curve, here again speaking about um, V1 for simplicity, uh, this you can express as a weighted average um, of the first and the third examples. Okay, so of a Uniswap x times y curve uh, and also a sort of constant sum uh, x plus y curve. And moreover, the coefficients in that weighted average actually depend on the ratio between uh, y and x. If y and x are sort of roughly the same, close to the same quantities, then the x plus y term dominates. But once x or y gets, once the ratio x over y gets close to zero or close to infinity, uh, at that point, the Uniswap type curve x times y uh, is the one that dominates. Okay, but so the point is, these are some DEXs out there you may have heard of. Um, and CFMMs, it's a really nice uh, abstraction that captures all of these examples uh, as well as others. All right, so I hope that sort of at this point in the talk, you maybe have the feeling that we've descended uh, deep enough into that tree, mapping out the DeFi space, you know, that now we have something bite-sized enough we might conceivably be able to prove some cool theorems. And in particular, let's imagine we try to carry out that three-step optimization approach I mentioned earlier, where we articulate a design space, propose some objectives, and identify some optimal or near-optimal designs. How would that work um, if you wanted to apply that specifically to constant function market makers? Well, as usual, step one is just like, you know, what's the design space? You know, but here we're actually kind of halfway there, right? It's sort of clear that, you know, the, the design space is defined by this choice of the invariant function, little f. Now we're not done, right? Because presumably some Fs make more sense than others. Presumably we don't want to think about the function F, which is, you know, zero on the rationals and one on the irrationals. So we do want to ask the question like what mathematical properties should we restrict F to have so that we get sort of a design space of sensible invariant functions. The other question we want to ask is, you know, is the invariant function really the best way or the most sort of illuminating way to parameterize the design space? Or is there some alternative parameterization which might be equally or even more useful. So those are the things we want to be on the lookout for. Then question two um, is, you know, can we prove guarantees, you know, with respect to some objective or some mathematical property uh, for the existing designs, right? So for example, if, if you believe that Uniswap is the answer, um, what's the question that it's answering? Can we sort of have a post hoc sort of justification of, let's say, Uniswap um, as the unique um, uh, AMM that has certain properties? That's the second thing we want to be on the lookout for. Uh, and ideally, we'd want to have even a theory of optimal CFMMs, whatever that means. Okay, so with respect to some natural objective function, we would like to say like, oh, if this is what you care about, this is the little f you really should be using. This is the best CFM to use. That would be the, that would be the best case. So let me address those questions uh, one at a time, uh, beginning with the first question about articulating and parameterizing the design space of constant function market makers. And on this slide, I'm going to be following quite closely um, a model that's been explored in a very nice sequence of papers over the last year plus by Guillermo Angaris, Tarun Chitra, uh, and Alex Evans. And in particular, uh, they answered the question, what sensible restrictions should we impose on the trading function little f uh, so that it makes sense in the context of AMS? So let me explain first um, the mathematical property that they pointed out we should impose on little f. For simplicity, let's consider the case of just two tokens. I mean, the, the model and the theory is sort of more general, but just think there's A tokens, there's B tokens, quantities X and Y. 
Uh, let's go ahead and draw the sort of Uniswap curve, the x times y equals k curve. That's the, that's the one you see that sort of starts up high and then bends to the right as you go down. And what I want you to notice is that if you look at everything that's to the northeast of that x times y equals k curve, that level set of the function x times y, if you look at everything to the northeast of that curve, that's a convex set. Okay, and remember, a set is convex if it's completely filled in. So you take any two points of the set, the entire line segment between the two points should also belong to the set. That's a convex set. So that's true, certainly, of the x times y equals k curve, as we see in this picture. Uh, but and Garris had all really noted that kind of whatever function f you want to think about, you should really think about functions that have this property. It doesn't have to be this specific curve, x times y equals k, but it should be the case that the stuff to the northeast of the curve is, in fact, uh, a convex set. So we'll be, we'll be going with that also in this talk. All right, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention, you know, that they pointed out really the sensible restriction um, on trading functions little f that we should look at. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight from that sequence of papers is an alternative parameterization uh, of the design space. Okay, a way to parameterize CFMMs not by the trading function little f, but by a different value function, uh, capital V, which I'll tell you about now. This is maybe my favorite result from the whole sequence of papers. Um, it's from the paper called Replicating Market Makers. Okay, so what's the idea behind this alternative parameterization? What's the idea behind this uh, function capital V? Well, the intuition is that capital V is going to be the value of a portfolio. And I say value here in terms of some numeraire, like think for example, US dollars. So the value of a portfolio, it obviously depends on a couple things. So first of all, you know, how many tokens of type A there are in the portfolio, how many tokens of type B there are. Furthermore, it depends on sort of the external market prices. So the price on the open market for token A and token B, right? The more tokens you have, the bigger your value is going to be. The higher the going prices for those tokens, the bigger the value of the portfolio is going to be. But V is going to depend not just on the token quantities and not just uh, on the um, external market prices. It will also depend on what AMM you are using. Okay, so what trading invariant function little f is available to arbitrageurs. Because mind you, you know, at equilibrium, arbitrageurs, if they can make money by trading against your portfolio, they're going to do it using the AMM in which this portfolio rests. So the final definition then of the function capital uh, V, it's just going to be the USD value of the, of the portfolio after optimal arbitrage. After arbitrageurs have gone in and made whatever allowable trades that they want, meaning any trade that leaves the trading function little f invariant. If you think about it, there's sort of a zero-sum game being played between the arbitrageurs uh, and the portfolio owner. So equivalently, this is kind of like the worst case USD value of the portfolio after any allowable trade, any trade that leaves f invariant. Okay, so that's capital V, the value of a portfolio that notice depends on the choice of the trading function little f, because that controls what it is arbitrageurs are able to do. And so the big idea in this replicating market makers paper is then to parameterize the design space of all constant function market makers, not by the training function little f, but rather by the value function capital V. All right, so to call this a parameterization, a reparameterization, we need to talk about sort of how V's and F's correspond to each other. Um, and one thing that's very easy to notice, uh, any value function capital V you get, so no matter what um, trading function little f you look at, you're going to get a, a value function that is one homogeneous. That sounds fancy, but all that means is if you double the market prices of both tokens, you're going to double the, in, in USD terms, you will also double the USD value of the portfolio, which sounds obvious and is kind of obvious. Uh, and furthermore, you will also get a value function that is concave in the market prices uh, for any uh, fixed portfolio X comma Y. This concavity is related to the impermanence or divergence loss that um, liquidity providers experience uh, in AMMs. You know, basically, as sort of prices go further and further apart from each other, it's worse and worse for you. So that's kind of the concavity of capital V. That's the intuitive way to think about it. So those are properties that are pretty easy to establish, right? You start from some training function little f, you pass to the value function. Uh, who knows what you get, but you certainly get something that's both concave and one homogeneous. Um, and then the really cool theorem from this paper says that actually the converse is true as well. So if you show me any capital V, which satisfies these two properties, concavity and one homogeneity, okay, and technically, you know, non-negativity also, then in fact, there exists a corresponding trading function, little f. So in other words, if you want, instead of specifying little f, just specify for me a capital V that's one homogeneous 
uh, and concave in the market prices, and I will be able to reverse engineer from your value function the trading invariant function little f you should use in your AMM. So this, in my opinion, is a, is a quite cool result. It gives us really a, a fundamentally different and really non-obvious way to think about the design space of CFMMs instead via these capital V's instead of the more obvious way uh, through the little f's. Now you might remember at the beginning of the talk I said you know theory um, produces hard theorems sometimes, but to get there you need easy theorems, and before that you need definitions. Um, and so this I definitely think qualifies as an easy theorem in the best sense of the word. Okay, so a theorem which you know on the one hand one was able to formulate and prove in the very early days of DeFi, on the other hand it might plausibly lead to sort of a deeper and more general theory uh, in the years to come. Okay, so when I said we were starting to have you know some easy theorems in the DeFi space, this is one of the things. I had in mind. So on the next slide, I want to tell you about uh, yet another reparameterization of the design space of constant function market makers that my student Jason Milionis and I have been sort of exploring. Um, before I do that, maybe I just should comment on like, you know, why do we need to, under why do we want to understand this design space in like multiple different ways? Why all these different parameterizations? Um, but notice, I mean, that's something you see over and over again in mathematics and theoretical computer science, right? Like when you first learn the regular languages, you know, you learn about regular languages, you, they're characterized by regular expressions, they're characterized by DFAs, they're characterized by NFAs. You know, why do you want so many different ways to represent the same object? Well, it's because some representations are more convenient for some results, other representations for other results, right? If you want to prove like closed under complementation, that's going to be much easier under some of the representations of regular languages than others. So, so too, the hope would be that having all these different ways of understanding CFMMs will really help us, you know, build out uh, a kind of very um, satisfying theory. So the alternative parameterization we've been looking at uh, is via the spot price uh, implied by the trading function, which you know we think is a pretty natural uh, thing to focus on. So by spot price, just to be clear, what I mean is the price of a marginal unit of token A denominated in token B. So this is what for Uniswap, as we mentioned earlier, is Y over X, where Y is the number of B tokens and X is the number of A tokens. Right, so the fewer A tokens um, that you have, the more expensive it's going to be for you uh, to buy some more, for example. Interestingly, if you go back to Alan Liu's um, post uh, in introducing the X times Y equals K curve, he actually starts by proposing the spot price and then backs out the, the now famous X times Y equals K curve rather than the other way around. Um, as far as I know, the other examples of CFMMs we've been looking at did not start from the spot price, didn't necessarily even focus on the spot price um, all that much. This is a very nice, nice geometric interpretation um, of focusing on the spot price as a function of the ratio of y um, and x. Really, it's just kind of the slopes of that uh, bounding curve of the convex set, right? So that we, we said, what are the properties that we want of the function little f? Uh, we want that if you look at everything to the northeast of its graph, that should be a convex set. Uh, and this marginal, this, this spot price is really just the slopes uh, along that bounding curve of that, of that region. And in our opinion, you know, this parameterization may be at least, if not more natural and useful than the two that I mentioned so far, uh, rather than looking explicitly at the, at the trading function little f uh, or the value function capital V. Uh, so for example, again, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder a little bit, um, but curve is usually stated in terms of its uh, trading function as this sort of weighted average of the x times y equals k uh, and constant sum uh, trading functions. We think actually it's quite a bit easier to interpret curve, I'm talking about V1 here, uh, in terms of the spot price, right? So the Uniswap spot price would be this Y over X, and then you can see very cleanly how it gets modulated um, by the second term. Here, alpha and beta uh, are suitable constants. The numbers aren't really important for us here. Um, but the point is this 2X plus Y over X plus 2Y, that's the sort of very simple way of modulating what would be the normal uh, Uniswap spot price. And now that we have this kind of alternative understanding um, of curve through its spot price, uh, we feel better positioned to perhaps answer the question, is, is curve optimal in some sense? Um, you know, curve's goal is to sort of have a lot of liquidity around parity uh, while giving up stuff sort of at the extreme points. So we get asked, does it sort of optimally implement that goal or could there be something better? Uh, and we suspect that this kind of spot price viewpoint is going to be crucial for answering those questions. So that's what I wanted to say about the first question, articulating the design space, parameterizing it, and now we've seen three different ways. 
Um, the second question was, you know, can we sort of justify existing designs in any way? So if you believe that Uniswap is somehow the answer to something, um, what exactly is the question for which, for which it's the answer? Uh, and here there is, I want to mention some easy observations. I suspect these are known to experts, but I've never really seen them written explicitly like this. And I think if you haven't seen, if you haven't thought about this for, before, I do think it's helpful. Uh, so f let's start with the x times y equals k curve, so the Uniswap curve. Uh, here's something you can prove, right? Which is that uh, no matter what the market prices are, so I was calling these px and py earlier, uh, post arbitrage, so again, assuming that arbitrageurs um, will trade along the allowable curve, the x times y equals k curve, uh, to maximize their revenue and minimize the portfolio value, uh, post arbitrage, both sides of a Uniswap pool are guaranteed to have equal USD value. Okay? So as the prices change, so too will the quantities on each side of the pool at equilibrium. But in fact, the cash value will always be equal. Okay, the cash value of the A tokens in the pool, same as the cash value of the B tokens in the pool. So that's the easy to deduce property about, about Uniswap, x times y equals k. Uh, and in fact, you can prove sort of a, a representation result saying this is the only way to do it. Okay, not quite. Um, you can take some function, some invertible function of x times y, uh, but those are the only trading functions a little left that have this property of guaranteeing at equilibrium equal cash values of both sides of the pool. Uh, not so difficult to generalize this to balancer pools, both in the sense of there being multiple tokens and in the sense of there being non-uniform weights. Uh, my sense is that actually maybe the designers of balancers, a balancer, were actually thinking in these terms um, when they proposed. Uh, their AMM. Okay, but in any case, you know, if you have a balancer pool with weights 0.7 and 0.3, um, it is the case that no matter what the external market price is at equilibrium, there will be a 70% 30% cash value split uh, across the two two tokens in a balancer pool. Finally, let me touch on the the last of the three questions, maybe the most ambitious one. You know, could you have optimality results for CFMMs? Uh, this is totally wide open. Honestly, we, we don't even really, I think, understand what are the right objective functions um, with which to discuss uh, optimality. Um, that said, I think it's totally reasonable to expect uh, nice research progress on this question over the next over the next year, year or two. And I'm eagerly hoping to see work along those lines. Um, a couple specific things, you know, I'm wondering about. So first, back to this question of like, you know, what to what problem is Uniswap the solution? Uh, and there's this, this original intuition behind Uniswap and the x times y equals k curve that somehow it ensures you have, you know, lots of stuff to trade with even as the, you know, prices move in a very volatile fashion. So is there some sense in which like worst case over all possible price movements, Uniswap does sort of the least bad, sort of minimizes uh, the slippage that you're going to have to suffer. That I think is part of the intuition that went into it. I've never seen that formalized as an actual as an actual guarantee. Uh, I mentioned Curve uh, on the previous slide. You know, its raison d'etre uh, is to make sure you have very little slippage uh, near parity, near a price of one. Um, but on the other hand, you make these compromises to make sure you actually can support trades at all prices. So you could again ask the question: Is Curve somehow optimal with respect to that goal? Um, or is the you know seemingly ad hoc proposed curve uh, trading function could that be improved in some way? Okay. Also, uh, I think a very interesting question. Um, intuitively, there should be like some kind of conservation of slippage property, right? So like curve by virtue of kind of having less slippage around parity should be suffering more elsewhere. Again, that's a statement I don't know how to f how to formalize. That you just you kind of have to trade off which part of the of the price range. Um, you want to do well in. That seems intuitively true, but I don't know the right way to phrase that. Uh, and then really ambitiously, but I think not hopeless, would be to have some very generic optimality result. Really some kind of theorem that acts as a compiler where you feed into it your assumptions about what market prices are going to look like. And then it feeds back to you um, the trading curve, little f, you know, or the value function, capital V, or the spot price, whatever. It feeds back to you the AMM, which is optimal with respect to your beliefs about future price movements. Um, and really a role model here would be something from auction theory, Meyerson's optimal auction theory. And that's a theorem which basically takes as input assumptions about the distribution of what people are willing to pay and gives you back as output the expected revenue maximizing auction with respect to that distribution. So I think it's conceivable you could have uh, something similar here.
So I would not say we have a theory of DeFi yet. I do think we could have a theory of DeFi emerging over the next uh, several years. I would love to see some of the people um, who have watched this talk uh, contribute. If you do, please keep me posted. Send me your papers. Uh, I look forward to following progress uh, on all of these topics. So thanks very much. Uh, that's it for me.